right? Uh, and thanks again, thanks again for, for hosting me here. Um, also thanks to the European Association of Geochemistry for giving the opportunity to uh, give these lectures. Um, first, I will provide some information. I I always have a problem with the first slide now, so this was too close. Uh, some information from the EAG. Um, there's a lot of support available for early career scientists, the student sponsorship program, the great early career science ambassador program, and the great job platform on the EAG website for different positions. So if you need more information, uh, go to the website or get directly in contact with the EAG office. Um, there's also the Society Community Journal Geochemical Perspectives Letters. It's open access and your page charges so publications for free. Uh, for short uh, articles, 3,000 words, and some high quality uh, results. Uh, so just to give Again, a little bit more detailed information about my educational track record. So uh, I did my bachelor's and master's at the Karl von Wieseckia University in, in Oldenburg, Germany, uh, and then did a PhD at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, moved for a postdoc to the LMTG in Toulouse, and then moved for another postdoc and then an assistant professor position to the University of Bristol in the UK. And since 2017, I'm um, at the University of Lima in, in Brussels. Um, so my research is, is mainly focused on carbon cycle climate interactions and feedbacks on very different timescales. So this morning I talked about going back in time from a million years ago, looking at big carbon cycle perturbation and seeing how the system reacted to this. And now I want to talk a little bit about um, climate change and how we can use some of the natural processes potentially to um, help solve the problem we are currently having. So to provide a bit of context, so I think everyone knows the Keeling curve. So this is a, a very long-term record of atmospheric CO2. So it was the first one that really provided the scientific evidence that CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere is rising. So you have here a continuous uh, monthly recording from the late 50s until today. Um, you can see this increase in atmospheric CO2 concentrations in the seasonal cycle here. Uh, that's all aligned, this long-term trend. And then what's marked here is like um, the different uh, events and kind of climate research. Uh, so the, the first conference, so since now we know that since the early 70s, uh, there was a, a lot of discussion already about man-made climate change. Uh, the famous Hansen testimony, testimony to the US Congress in, in the 80s, uh, the United Nations Framework on Climate, the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Accords, and then the historical Paris Agreement. And you can see that none of this had a significant impact on this general trend. So there is CO2 concentration is increasing. It continues to increase. Uh, if you if you have the updated curve, you see that there was a little dip um, during the COVID period because of the dip in anthropogenic um, emissions uh, during the lockdowns, but this has regained its more value again, so uh, we really haven't made much progress there. Um, this is a little error message that's popping up, but I'll just say okay. So I know I think so. Let's do this. Yeah, I, I, I just say cancel. <laughs> Yes, what is it doing? So, that's really fine. Um, yeah, and you can do the same uh, exercise with the IPCC reports. Is you see the same um, until the Paris Agreement. Um, so that's a quite historical event. So in 2015 in Paris, 196 nations got together 
um, to formulate very ambitious goals. And this is the ambitious goals to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees of prior pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees of pro above pre-industrial levels. So that these are very, very ambitious goals. They were commonly agreed. They are frames in the temperature space because we know that uh, through research that um, global mean surface temperature increases roughly proportional to the CO2, the accumulated CO2 emissions uh, since pre-industrial times. So you can directly relate that. And what that means is like you have to commit to significantly decrease greenhouse gas emissions, especially CO2 emissions. So where are we in this? So here you see like the CO2 data, uh, you see the little COVID tip. Um, these are our policy actions. So this is the track we are currently on. So this is what has been committed in, in terms of policies and reduction. So that would mean roughly three degrees warming. I think there was uh, there's a lot of media attention right now on this because COVID 28 is coming up. Um, if you take the 2030 targets, we would be still like 2.4 degrees warming. Um, that are the pledge targets, 2.1. So this, this would be the upper range of the Paris ambitions, the more optimistic scenario. And this is really the highly optimistic scenario to limit to 1.5 degrees warming. Uh, warming. And what that, what that mean is like that we would have to balance the emissions, so the sources and sinks, and get to zero, net zero emissions. So that means like sources and sinks are balanced by mid of the century, so until 2050. And we basically have to the end of this decade to really make efforts towards these goals. Um, otherwise it's too late. But this will sound very negative. Uh, 3D green warming is already better than uh, what was predicted 10 years ago, where we were still on track for much higher um, warming and, and climate change. So there is already progress. It's just, it needs to be faster and it needs to be more radical. So to reach these parent goals, so these are all pledges and promises. What needs to be done is a, a radical decrease in CO2 emissions. So you can see what would need to be done. So if we would have started um, reducing CO2 emissions back in the early 2000s, um, we, we would have had longer time and we would have had to reduce by um, much less. Um, if we wait till the end of this decade, you would have to have a drastic decrease to reach this really ambitious goal. So, um, doesn't really look like reducing CO2 uh, emissions to uh, net zero would actually require huge transformations and um, a, a huge modification of how we operate as a global society. Uh, it doesn't look like this is something that is going to happen at the time scale we need to happen or we need it to happen. Then on top of this, um, it's also there is probably like a, a certain fraction of the global CO2 emissions that are not avoidable, that, that will always be there. Um, but it's shown here in, in brown. Uh, so you can reduce CO2 emissions um, by, for instance, switching to green technologies, um, reducing your emissions, making things more efficient, but there will be always a certain CO2, anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Um, and this has led to uh, the need to develop carbon dioxide removal technologies. So that means basically these are technologies that would directly take CO2 out of the atmosphere or carbon out of the atmosphere um, and would create negative emissions. It's more safe. And they could compensate for these residual emissions, but also they could really speed up uh, the need at which our CO2 emission reductions. Um, some people also propagate that like, well, they could be used to actually reduce the need for us to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, you will see this not really realistic and it's, there is no silver bullet to this all. And um, even with this carbon dioxide removal technologies, we will still drastically have to remove or reduce CO2 emissions. 
But CDR is a reality. It's something like that needs to be done as well. And it's part of all of the climate um, projections. If we want to reach the Paris goals, if we want to reach the emissions, if we want to limit global warming to a certain limit, then we need carbon dioxide removal. There's just no way around. So let's have a look. What is there? What is carbon dioxide removal or negative emission technologies? So you can roughly divide this in three main groups. Um, there's biological uh, based technologies. So that is here like afforestation, reforestation, forest management, um, wood utilization instead of other building materials, for instance, and soil management, including biochar. This is something which is already done and it's already kind of operating to a certain scale. Then we have technological um, technologies. So uh, this is a very famous, this is uh, something that's talked about a lot, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So the idea is that you, you grow biomass, uh, then you burn it and you capture the carbon. So you, the energy produced is used and you capture the carbon and, and store it. Um, this is uh, propagated as uh, the, the solution, basically. Um, you have direct air capture, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, through huge um, structures that directly suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, there are some prototypes of this as well. And then you have the geochemical process. That's something we are interested in. So there are two, this is enhanced weathering. So basically um, having minerals, having minerals weather, and then that produces alkalinity, which would then take CO2 out of the atmosphere and stores it um, in, in certain mineral products um, in the soil or in the sea. Uh, and ocean fertilization, again, a very uh, natural process, it would just like provide limiting nutrients to certain ocean areas, uh, stimulate primary productivity, and that would ultimately bury more carbon um, in the sediment. Now, this has fallen a little bit out of grace because uh, we know this has been uh, something uh, that has been studied for a long time, and uh, we know that this is creating um, a lot of secondary effects. There are tailor connections, the Earth system is very complex. So, if you put something into one spot, then it does probably what you want it to do, but it does a lot of other things as well. Um, and I guess it's the same as the weather. So, uh, especially with the geochemical uh, based technologies, there are still a lot of open questions. So it's like how efficient is that, but also what are the other effects on the system uh, apart from the effect you actually desire? Um, the only problem is we really need these technologies and we need to develop these technologies. Uh, here are projected emission trends. These are all the scenarios that would lead to reaching the uh, Paris climate goals, and uh, these are basically the, this is the amount of uh, CDR that would be needed uh, for each of these scenarios. Here you have, for instance, uh, one that's based on reducing the demand, one that's based on developing a lot of renewable energies, uh, one that's based on carbon removal, and depending on these scenarios, you would need more or less of the CDR uh, to remove carbon. But the fact is that we need these technologies to be operational and up to scale to remove significant amount of CO2 uh, per year from the atmosphere. Um, and currently, we are, you don't see that very well, but uh, currently in terms of CDR, what we are deploying, uh, we are here in this range. So that means that till the middle of this uh, millennium, we have to, or this century, we have to like really scale up the CDR. So, what can we scale up? Currently, this little um, range here is uh, less than two gigaton CO2 per year that we are actively removing from the atmosphere is mostly um, supported by what we call conventional methods. So they are, they are basically the, the forest management and soil management methods and only a tiny, tiny fraction. So you can see here, uh, that's uh, this little orange line and then this is zoomed in, is um, provided by the more normal 
uh, methods. The problem was, you would say like, well, okay, we have these methods, we, we know that forest and soil management work, uh, they're removing, all we have to do is scale it up, they come with additional benefits to biodiversity, so it's great, so why don't we just focus on this? Um, the problem with this is like, uh, well, there's a limited, they are already quite up to scale, there's a limited amount of land available um, that you can use for these methods. And then when you look at the time scales, so these are different carbon reservoirs, and this is a characteristic time scale, the carbon is fixed in these reservoirs, and the trees and soils fix the carbon obviously only for a limited amount of time. I mean, 100 to 1,000 years is still okay for our purposes, um, but it's also prone to disturbances, um, more extreme events, more erosion, things like that, that can disturb these systems. So um, they are obviously like, now when we look at the, the aspects that interest us as earth scientists, the geological formations or minerals, marine sediments, they're obviously like, great reservoirs because they really take, and this is how the earth system works, right? They take the carbon away and store it for a really long time on geological time scales. So they would really like take this away and store it in that. So we have multiple problems here. So the, the techniques that are already working um, that have been developed and that are currently removing CO2 actively don't have like a large potential to be significantly more scaled up and the other techniques uh, we haven't really developed yet. Uh, they are not scaled up and we have no real um, idea about all of the risks involved in this. Nevertheless, to limit warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees, we need to upscale, we need to upscale these uh, conventional methods by a factor of 1.3 to 2 until the middle of the century. And we need to really rapidly upscale by a factor of 30 to 1,300 these novel methods that are still in their infancy um, to reach the Paris climate goals. And this is, this is next to drastically reducing CO2 emissions. We also have to do this. So none of this is coming without the requirement of drastically reducing CO2 emissions. If we manage to reduce CO2 emissions Faster and more significantly, we need less of this, so, which, which is a good thing. So it's always a goal to first reduce CO2 emissions, but we also need the carbon uh, CO2 removal uh, techniques. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the geochemical process and let's have a look at this enhanced weathering. So enhanced weathering, what is the general idea behind this? Um, it's fairly easy. This is exactly how the Earth system works. That's the thermostat of the Earth system, the water thermostat. Um, it's like you have CO2 going into the atmosphere, coming, for instance, from volcanic sources. Um, it forms up the atmosphere. It comes with an increased hydrological cycle, higher temperatures, and you increase silicate weathering or weathering, not weathering on land, among which is silicate weathering. So silicates are weathering, and this weathering contributes alkalinity to the rivers that's taken out uh, in the rivers out to the ocean, increases the alkalinity of the ocean, and then in the ocean, this alkalinity eventually is precipitated as carbonate, that then are buried in the sediment and remove the carbon from the atmosphere. So this is how this thermostat works. So that's great, right? So this is already happening um, in the earth. This is something that's already controlling our climate uh, and has controlled earth climate um, over the entire history of the earth. Um, there's just a problem. It's a geological process and geological processes are notoriously slow. Um, that's the whole point of geological processes. So here you have there's rock weathering feedback, and here you see response time scales, and generally, like these weathering feedbacks, they fall here in this range. So, to really see an effect, uh, the, the time scales are between 10,000 to up to a million years. So, yeah, we obviously don't have that time, right? Because uh, we need to do something now, and we need to have immediate effects. 
So that's a little bit of the problem. So we don't have the time of the Earth system. So eventually the Earth system will respond to that and will remove that carbon, as much carbon as we put in. Um, it's just much too slow uh, for us. Uh, there will be um, quite significant changes on Earth beforehand, before the Earth system is reacting to this. So the idea of the CDR technologies would be to speed that process up. So how can we speed that process up? Well, there are a lot of different factors we can play with here. Um, first, we need to find suitable minerals. Uh, not all minerals weather at the same rates and not all minerals contribute the same amount of alkalinity and other things. <laughs> what we need, because there's this is always a little bit of the balance in these methods. Um, of course, you, you could come up with a, a, a great ideal solution of how you just like distribute minerals everywhere and like really rapidly weather, but they have to come from somewhere. So we need minerals that are very abundant um, on Earth nowadays that we can really reach to keep down the costs so to make this technique uh, efficient, but also keep down the CO2 emissions we will produce by employing these um, techniques. Uh, we need minerals that dissolve very rapidly um, and they have to have they have to be a, a source of cations from stable carbonate minerals for to form stable carbonate minerals, uh, manganese, for instance, or calcium. Um, there's a good candidate for that, uh, automatic rocks. So that's kind of the target material. When we look at that, and when we look at the composition of that, so ideally we are really looking up here in this area, um, uh, the olivine range, but um, all of these uh, are basically uh, candidate materials. Uh, they are relatively widespread, uh, easy to mine. And then here you see uh, results from uh, a leaching experiment with ammonium bisulfate. And this is also, this is why olivine is, is often um, uh, propagated as a, as a Candidate mineral because um, it, it reacts very rapidly. It depends on the crystal structure, how rapidly they, they weather and what they release. Um, so this is basically the, the selected mineral. So what else? What else can we do? Um, well, you can take these rocks and you can expose them to weathering. So distribute them a little bit. Um, then we know that weathering uh, rates are related to reactive surface area. Um, so the idea is to, to grind these rocks up, to pulverize those, to increase the, the reactive surface area, of creating smaller particles that would enhance weathering rates, um, distribute these minerals in locations with naturally enhanced weathering rates. Uh, typically when you look, this is um, weathering indices, um, you find really high weathering rates here around the tropics. Um, again, uh, in the tropics, land surface is a little bit limited. Um, also, like, yeah, obviously, the Amazon area has very high weathering rates, but you also there is forest uh, that's quite beneficial for CO2 uptake as well. So uh, it's, it's limited, the areas you can really distribute this to. And this is a little bit of a problem. Um, then obviously if you grind the rock up, this takes energy, this will create new CO2 emissions. So um, this is also not very efficient if you if you have to grind the rock up to very, very small sizes, then your uh, deploying your method will already emit a lot of CO2. So you have to be much more efficient to then have a net uh, negative emission um, if you take all of the emissions together. Um, another factor that can enhance weathering without necessarily having to like grind it up to very, very small sizes is uh, movement. So this year are some experiments that show dissolution rate uh, depending on uh, weathering experiments here in the stagnant setup, one in low rotation and high rotation, and these are um, literature values to compare with, and you can see like if you have a little bit of movement, you, you can achieve higher weathering rates. Um, so typically, enhanced weathering has been proposed 
for soils and agricultural soils would be pretty easy to uh, distribute the minerals there because we only have people working on, on the soil. But again, this is very, very limited uh, in terms of surface area. And therefore, uh, the proposition was, and this is a, a new thing is to say like, well, let's look at the sediments, right? We have the global continent of shell, just all around our continents. Here you can see it. this is a huge surface area where you could just distribute minerals. And there's also like in the coastal ocean, you have activity, there's stretching activity, there's fishing activity. So there's infrastructure to, to bring out these minerals uh, that would be available so that could be efficiently combined. Uh, the idea would be also that um, you distribute it. So these ships, they have spreading zones, they distribute that close to the sediment. Um, then it dissolves in the sediment. You would have maybe secondary mineral precipitations, but also al alkalinity efflux to the water column that would shift this carbonate um, equilibrium towards this side, uh, decreasing the CO2 concentration or the partial breath of CO2 in the water column. And that would mean you would take up more CO2 from the water column. Um, where it then uh, reacts over time scales. The additional benefit of doing that in the coastal ocean would be that this is a very dynamic environment. So sediments are moving around all the time. You have erosion, you have depositions. You would have this, this current so that would continuously move the particles and grind them up a little bit. So instead of having to do that artificially, the environment is taking care of you for this, so it's continuously exposing things, but also um, creating small particle sizes. And then you have like the benthic fauna in the upper sediment that would continuously remove the products and efficiently bring them back to the to the water column. And because you have like in the upper sediment aerobic degradation of organic material with oxygen. Uh, so this is acid, acidifying the pool just a little bit and uh, low pH also painless uh, weathering rates. So this is a nice idea, um, but we don't really know yet um, by how much this enhanced marine silicate weathering could increase alkalinity fluxes from uh, marine sediments, uh, which environmental factors influence its efficiency. Um, you've seen that already talked about this a little bit in the first talk. Uh, marine sediments are basically characterized by a very complex and dynamic interplay of different transport and reaction processes. So just by promoting one process doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the system will give you the response you're looking for. There might be a, a lot of other processes that will then um, happen in response to that perturbation that, that you are giving to the sediment. Uh, so it's very difficult to figure this out. Um, so how can we figure this out? Well, there are different ways. Well, we can go and study natural environments. That's something like um, uh, we are just doing. So we have been to Iceland, uh, where you have a, a lot of basalt um, uh, on, on the island that's weathered and then brought into the coastal ocean. So these sediments have a lot of uh, basaltic um, silicate rich uh, rocks and minerals in them, and there should be higher weathering rates. Um, so this is data we are currently analyzing. You can also, just like a model, build your own little coastal sediment, but this time in real, so not virtually, but in real. So this is the University of Antwerp. They are having these uh, mesocosm experiments where they basically just take a part of the uh, coastal ocean seafloor and put it in this tank um, and then spread olivine on top and then measure what happens. So basically measure the outflux, uh, the alkalinity outflux, but they are also looking at other things like trace levels. And, uh, DSC and things like that. Or again, in combination, uh, you can also build your virtual sediment. So this is this is something really great because this is with the mesocosm that's really cool, but that's limited. I mean, there are only that many mesocosms you have. You can have, as you can see, they already have a lot. Um, but let's say you want to test different minerals or different deployment frequencies or um, different conditions, um, then you very rapidly reach kind of a limit of how much you can do. 
the same with natural rays. It's, it's not necessarily exactly what we are looking for. Um, these are basaltic materials, uh, not necessarily always olivine. There you can find locations where you have a lot of olivine that's weathering into the environment, um, but they are not necessarily the same that in your local environment or the environment you're interested in deploying this. Um, rates might, might be much lower because the particles that come in are a different size. So if you combine all of this with the modeling, you have already a, a quite nice approach that allows you to test a lot of different um, conditions and parameters. And based on that, uh, you can then really target your observational campaigns and your mesoposm experiments. So that already helps you to test hypothesis, to, to test sensitivities, you know, what's the role of organic matter input, what's the role of sedimentation rate on this. And from this, you can identify really critical factors and then efficiently design your experiments. So it's really the combination of all of this. So what's the idea here? So we have this virtual sediment column uh, with all of the diagenetic processes resolved in it uh, that's exchanged with the water column. And then we can have different experiments. Uh, we can just put uh, different minerals all across the sediment column, like it would happen in a natural environment, or we can just like put some olivine on, on top of the, of the surface sediment and let it bury and look at the response. We can test different sedimentation rates, we can test different organic matter inputs and things like that. So first, so we built this model. So um, it's, it's coupling the entire redox uh, biogeochemistry that's typically, typically happening in, in marine sediments with organic matter degradation, the, the terminal electron acceptors, then the byproducts of these reactions, um, alkalinity, DIC, and pH dynamics, um, calcite or carbonate precipitation and dissolution in response to that, um, iron sulfide burial, um, and uh, manganese and iron carbonate precipitation. And we couple that with a silicon uh, reaction network. So where you have like uh, silicates that uh, dissolve and um, autogenic silicate, biogenic silicate that can dissolve uh, the lithogenic ones and you have autogenic silicates of place that can precipitate. Um, to look at this a little bit more in detail in a natural environment, so when you look at the silica cycle, it's a silicon cycle in, in sediment. What you can see is a complex interplay, so you have like dissolution reactions that typically happen um, at the sediment surface is often biogenic silica is often very dominant in, in um, marine sediments and kind of overprints these uh, weathering signals. Um, but you have locations where you have less biogenic silica imprint or in the isotope data, you often see uh, the, the weathering signals. So you have this dissolution um, then because this releases a lot of, of uh, silicon and, and aluminium, then you oversaturate the cool waters with respect to the clay minerals. You have reverse weathering and precipitation of these autogenic phases. Um, you move down the redox boundary. Uh, you can have uh, silicon desorption from iron oxyhydroxides when they get used in the organic matter degradation, uh, or again, the precipitation uh, further down on the methanogenic side of the autogenic phases. So it's really this interplay, this complex interplay between this weathering reactions and re reverse weathering reactions. And this is already the problem here. You can see, well, it's not really a problem, um, but for our purpose, it's a bit of a problem because weathering produces alkalinity. That's what we want. Um, and we want this to get back to the water column, but reverse weathering then consumes alkalinity. So uh, it could be that some of this reverse weathering is consuming at least part of the alkalinity we are generating. Um, then you put that into the model. Uh, and this is just one uh, simple um, example of the model run. This is a typical post sediment, sediment, something typical you would find in the North Sea with relatively high organic carbon content. So you have the organic matter here that's deposited onto the sediment. 
it's degrading, this degradation slows a little bit because the reactivity uh, decreases during degradation. You have the accumulation of this uh, metabolites uh, from these metabolic uh, reactions. And then you see, so these are the results for different silicate weathering scenarios. So in pink, there's no silica weathering. Uh, and there's a more natural uh, silicate weathering and then enhanced silicate weathering. So it simply means this is like, there's no um, uh, silicate dissolution, it's just biogenic silica that, that uh, um, generates a little bit of, of uh, dissolved silica here. Uh, the natural is at relatively either at normal natural weathering rates or relatively low weathering rates, and enhanced this assuming higher weathering rates. So if you would grind up the rock, or you would take the minerals that dissolve a little bit faster than others. Um, what you can see here, it makes obviously a, a huge difference for the silica profile. So you produce much more uh, silica than. And the enhanced weathering case, it diffuses up and diffuses into the water column. So this would be a source um, of dissolved silicon to, to the water column where it could impact ecosystems. And then interestingly for the DID and the total alkalinity, you don't really see that much of a difference. And what you see in the surprising is like, especially for the enhanced case, you see actually a slightly lower accumulation of DIC and even of alkalinity, this is not really what you expect. Um, because uh, this this weathering would produce alkalinity. It's the same for the pH. There's uh, quite a difference uh, on the pH profile. So we have this typical decrease in the upper sediment that's driven by organic matter degradation. Um, then you have the increase that uh, would be driven by the weathering response, um, and then it decreases again. And this is the response of the different silicate um, minerals to these diagenetic dynamics. So what we see is a rapid dissolution of the different uh, minerals and then followed by a precipitation of a typical clay mineral. And when we look at the different rates, so this is for natural and the green is for enhanced, then you can see that um, the silicate dissolution is um, often compensated by this autogenic precipitation. So the, the alkalinity you produce in your dissolution uh, through this weathering um, is often then trapped um, as like this precipitate. So for the natural case, it's almost balanced. Um, for the enhanced, you would have uh, a slight dominance of the dissolution process, meaning that the net alkalinity production would be positive. So you would produce alkalinity, which you could potentially get out of the center. Um, that's kind of the same, that's just showing. Uh, so uh, this obviously depends a little bit on these balance for how quickly something weathers. Um, as compared to how quickly something can precipitate, so how quickly does the silicate weather in, in comparison to the precipitation of the clay minerals. Um, here you see the, the net alkalinity production. Um, this is for um, uh, the, the natural case, and this is for an enhanced silica weathering case. And then you have that for different uh, precipitation rates of altigenic clays and for different organic matter reactivities, just to complicate the picture a little bit. But what's important here, basically in the natural case, you can see there is a, a net alkalinity production. So dissolution um, dominates over precipitation. When you have a low reactivity of the, or a low precipitation rate of this altigenic minerals, but then as soon as these minerals precipitate at higher rates, um, you consume alkalinity. So the balance shifts towards the other. So this dissolution produces alkalinity that then um, encourages these, these minerals to, to precipitate. In the enhanced case, you can see there's always a dominance of this dissolution process because it's very efficient and very quick, but the um, autogenic uh, precipitation rates can really um, consume a lot of the alkalinity you produce. So um, this autogenic uh, precipitation is, is one of the factors that can really reduce the efficiency of this process because this alkalinity doesn't necessarily leave the sediment, but is trapped then through and consumed through this autogenic precipitation. 
So these are the modeling results. And it does actually happen in uh, nature as well. So these are this is some recent data from the Peruvian upwelling system. Um, here you can see shell sediments, different years. Um, and this year stands out a little bit, the 2017, um, in the, especially in the isotopic silica record. What you see here is like the subsurface peak that indicates that there's a huge reverse weathering signal. Um, happening in these sediments. And that uh, fits really, really well with the general oceanographic conditions. So this was a, a linear year, and uh, they also that proposed that there was a, a, a increased input of terrigenous material, very highly reactive clay minerals, and they like, then really increased these weathering rates, and they calculated that uh, these uh, these um, allergenic minerals must have pre precipitated on timescales of weeks. So this is this is uh, significantly faster than what we normally assume. So this can happen. There's really a balance, and that means that you reduce the alkalinity flux. You can even balance it or completely outcompete it. So you would you would basically have a negative um, net alkalinity flux. But this is not the only problem. So this reverse weathering, because um, in the sediment, nothing happens in isolation. And there are still all of these other processes that take place. So there's organic material that gets degraded by microbes. Um, then there are all the reduced uh, species that get produced, that get oxidized. You have minerals precipitating in response to all of this. Um, you have minerals dissolving in response to all of this. And all of these processes uh, impact the pH DSC alkalinity system. Um, here you can see the contribution. You can actually calculate that. You can calculate the contribution of each of these processes to, to um, the change in pH um, or the change in different carbonate ions. Um, in this case, it's, it's actually the carbonate ion. Um, and you can see it's a very complex network. Um, some processes uh, basically increase pH um, uh, and, and some like decrease pH, like um, yeah, organic uh, aerobic degradation of organic matters very dominant here is really driving this pH change. So you see the contribution of each process, they all happen simultaneously and they lead to this net change. Um, and it's very, very complex and it's a very dynamic system as well. So small differences can really make a huge difference to these very delicate balances. Um, so really disentangling all of this and understanding how the system would respond to this uh, alkalinity input through this solution is, is very complex. And this is really where the model can help. Um, you can look at typical natural alkalinity production and consumption in marine sediments. Uh, typically, if we take a uh, carbonate shelf, for instance, uh, you can see that uh, the main contributor of uh, this alkalinity production is, is um, organic matter degradation, typically sulfate production rates. Um, and then you have uh, carbonate precipitation that acts the other way around. And this is especially like the next, not really problem, but the next aspect to look at uh, is not only the precipitation of this autogenic uh, clays, but it's also other minerals that dissolve or precipitate. And we see that a lot in the sediments that there's always like this pull back to an equilibrium. So here is one example. So this is a very different example. Um, here you have my uh, sediment. And these are again simulated rates. This is a sediment that's um, subject to um, active methane renting. So you have methane coming from below uh, that gets consumed in a very intense anaerobic methane oxidation zone, um, and some of that might escape. So what happens is like you have sulfate reduction pulling the pH. Uh, to its higher values, and that's immediately counteracted by carbonate dissolution, calcium carbonate dissolution here that's pulling the pH back. Um, then you have AOM that's 
driving the pH up that's contributing to alkalinity. And that in response to that, you immediately have calcium carbonate precipitation. For what is as you uh, produce alkalinity, you shift the carbonate equilibrium from CO2 towards a carbonate ion. You have more carbonate ions, so the concentration increases. You increase the saturation state of your waters with respect to calcium carbonate, and they start precipitating, and they draw the pH and the saturation state back. So there are always like these um, reactions that then happen in response to something. And they, they always, obviously the response is like in the other direction. So let's have a look at this. Uh, so how does that look in the sediment? What's the role of carbonate precipitation in this weathering? And we are first looking at these natural settings because that's what we are interested in right now, but then we'll also look again at the enhanced weathering. So um, take the model and then we force it with a range of typical bottom water conditions. Uh, so we want to know what's the role of bottom water conditions, you know, does it really matter where we deploy? Uh, is, are there systems that are more favorable or less favorable? Um, so specifically in terms of saturation states of bottom waters and pH alkalinity VIC conditions, uh, range of sedimentation rate. Sedimentation rate is always like a dominant physical forcing in the sediment that it kind of determines how quickly things move through the column um, and organic matter input fluxes and reactivities because they drive this diagenetic reaction network. Um, and we want to test the different influence of those on the weathering rates. And we distribute the um, minerals all over the sediment column. So add kind of natural concentrations and typical distributions. So let's look at the alkalinity flux. Um, this is a total alkalinity flux that comes out of the sediment. So it's not really divided into different uh, parts. So this is just everything that comes out of the sediment as a function of sedimentation rate and total organic carbon input. Um, so this is a result of a lot of different model runs. And as you can see, as you, one would expect, the higher the organic carbon input, the higher the um, alkalinity flux, and then the higher the sedimentation rate, the higher the alkalinity flux, because you constantly bring um, more organic material in, so it's a higher flux down there. Um, main contributors, this is a net alkalinity flux, organic carbon degradation, as I said, this counteracted uh, by the um, secondary redox reactions, so the oxidation of these reduced compounds, um, then that compensates a bit of the, the dissolution that happens in the sediment, uh, but it's really driven by this organic matter degradation. So let's have a look at the bottom water conditions. Do they really play a significant role? And what we see is like here's a natural silicate weathering rate, this so alkalinity production from that silicate weathering, and you can hardly see a difference. So it doesn't really matter. And this is kind of good news because that means, you know, you could deploy it everywhere and it wouldn't have a big impact on what kind of bottom water conditions uh, you are deploying it. And it's the same with the reverse weathering, also hardly an influence. So it looks like the sil silicate weathering and the reverse weathering, so all of these cycles is largely controlled by the process that actually happened in the sediment. Um, so the early diagenetic process, how these reaction networks work. Um, let's have a look at how carbon, uh, organic carbon input affects the weathering. Um, here you can see the alkalinity produced uh, through silicate weathering as a function of total organic carbon input and its reactivity. So if I go from here to here, it's actually here, it's more reactive, here it's less reactive. Um, interestingly, what we see is like it's the less organic carbon I have and the least reactive it is, the higher this alkalinity contribution. Um, so this is also not directly logical. Uh, we see the same pattern in the reverse weathering, but this is probably related here to uh, the, the silicate weathering signal. This is just responding to this. And when we look a little bit into detail here, you see the different pH profiles. 
for the two, uh, the four different uh, end members here. Uh, what you can see is, is probably this one, this uh, area here where you have higher weathering rates or higher alkalinity production is basically driven by like a smoother transition. It's like you don't have like this rapid drops, but you have this drop that draws out over the entire sediment column, then slowly drives uh, this, this weathering because it's pH dependent. Well, here you only have a, a limited area or depth in the sediment where these conditions are very, very favorable. Um, so in, in general, so but also you don't see like the very pronounced response. Um, it's just with a natural weathering, it's, uh, it's relatively slow. Um, so, but what we see, and this is kind of surprising again, um, is like, uh, you, you, you see like there's already the strong response as this compensation of this reverse weathering already of some of this production. And then um, when we compare this, so this is the alkalinity flux um, that's coming from the sediment, again, as a function of reactivity of organic carbon and total organic carbon, you see it's negative. So there's a, a net alkalinity consumption so this is definitely not what we want. We want to produce alkalinity, right? We don't want to consume alkalinity. So where is this consumption coming from? And when you look at this, so this is the change in flux. If you have weathering versus if you don't have weathering, you see it's like you reduce the flux. Um, and where is this coming from? Well, if we do the same exercise, but don't allow carbonates to precipitate and dissolve, we see a very different pattern. Then we actually see a response. We see that there is alkalinity produced, that alkalinity fluxes increase uh, in the weathering scenarios. And again, this really highlights that there is a the effect that really depends on the secondary mineral formation. So there are the carbonates that really react to the silicate weathering. So you, you, you have the weathering, you produce alkalinity, but that also means you impact the carbonate system, you change your saturation state. This alkalinity will be consumed either through reducing carbonate dissolution or through precipitating carbonates. So it, it won't really get out of the system. So secondary minerals play a huge role in this. Um, this confirmed here. So uh, now we are looking at uh, the alkalinity fluxes from um, carbonate dissolution. Uh, four different reactivities here going from highly reactive to lowly reactive uh, organic material. Again, for our three scenarios no silicate weathering, natural silicate weathering, enhanced silicate weathering. And what you can see is like the silicate weathering scenarios, you significantly decrease the contribution of this um, alkalinity flux uh, or the, the, the carbonate dissolution. So carbonate dissolution rates decrease because you preserve more of this because you produce this alkalinity, which then buffers the system and decreases the undersaturation of carbonates that you typically have in the top sediment a uh, few centimeters, more carbonates um, gets preserved, less dissolved, and this consumes that alkalinity uh, you have uh, just generated. So instead of dissolving carbonates, you, you use that alkalinity to preserve them. Um, and that's true for all of the different scenarios. And depending on how, how high your weathering rates are, um, this is more or less pronounced. And this is again, this is going back to uh, the, the progress we saw earlier. This is exactly what we see there as well. So here we see the uh, silicate precipitation that already compensates part of the flux or almost entirely the flux. And then you really see like decrease in dissolution and an increase in precipitation. So it's really like consuming this alkalinity you produce by dissolving less carbonates and precipitating more carbonates. So it's this uh, opposing effect. And interestingly, that's something that um, is still puzzling us. There seems to be a bit of an overshoot of this. So, because normally you could say like, well, okay, I produce alkalinity and this alkalinity is then 
used up in the sediment by hopefully um, precipitated calcium carbonate. So it's, it's just the short circuit of the natural weather thermostat. It's not necessarily what you want immediately, um, but it's also not bad because you are, you're burning more carbonate. But um, there is a net acidification in all of this because it's like you reduce the alkalinity flux from the sediments as compared to the natural. Um, and we don't really understand yet why the system is reacting in this way, why it's overcompensating, why it's, um, it's reacting in the opposite way, where this is outcompeting then the alkalinity production. What we know is like this also happens in batch experiments. So here are some batch experiments of silicate weathering. You see the alkalinity production. So first you see an increase and suddenly in all of these batches, you see a sudden drop in alkalinity. Um, this is strange because silicates are weathering. You can see that here the silica, silica uh, concentration is still increasing. So they are still weathering. So why is the alkalinity decreasing? Um, and you can see here, this kind of coincides with a decrease in calcium concentration. So that means there are carbonates precipitating. So it's also happening in the batch experiments, not only in our virtual sediments. Um, so what we see is like that the formation of these secondary minerals in the form of these autogenic clays or carbonates can really affect this alkalinity system and reduce this effect, at least the desired effect in the first half. Um, so, but then, so this is this is still something like we need to explore, we need to explore a little bit more. Um, but then this is for natural sediments and a batch reaction. So what happens if we actually deploy actively uh, olivine on the surface of the sediment? So don't let it bury, but let it weather directly on the surface of the sediment in the first few centimeters. Is that actually having a very different effect? And so we did that experiment as well. So we take our virtual sediment and then we just put olivine on top of it. Um, so what I will show you here is like depth profile profiles of this olivine, the dissolution rates, the pH response, and the alkalinity response, and for different times. So this is at the beginning, then um, at T1, we see here the olivine has been deployed. It's getting incorporated in the sediment by bioactivation. Um, starts dissolving, uh, you, you start to see, uh, oh, you actually don't really see an impact on the pH just yet and on the alkalinity. After some time here, we see it over the entire biotubated zone, very high dissolution rates. And here you see already the, the increase in pH, you see a slight increase in alkalinity. Uh, after three years, you see mixing down. So this is just the pulsed. Um, so we are not continuously deploying, we just like put something on and then let it react. So this is why it's decreasing here at the surface. It's higher here. You see the weathering rate responding, pH increase, alkalinity. Um, and this effect then slowly disappears as all weather. So when we look at the time series, so this is basically the response. Uh, for a long time period. So obviously everything happens in the first decades. Um, here we look at olivine alkalinity production for uh, reactive, highly reactive and extremely reactive mineral phases. Uh, and there you see exactly what you expect is, is like a pulse in, in alkalinity production. So you employ the olivine, it, it gets weathered, um, and it produces alkalinity. But when we look at the net flux, we see a slightly different picture. Interestingly, we see exactly what we see in the batch experiments as well. Um, there's an increase. Um, in this case, in the natural sediment, it's about like um, one, two years. You see an increase in alkalinity flux, and then you see a decrease. You see kind of this overcompensation again. Uh, you see like there are processes that um, are acting in the sediment, they are drawing the system in the other direction. You see a decrease in the alkalinity flux and in all different experiments and it's differently pronounced. Like in the extremely reactive, it's, it's almost balanced. Um, in the highly reactive, you see the, the decrease is, is more pronounced than the increase, the initial increase. 
and then the reactive is, is probably also almost balanced. And then you, you reach a new steady state, which in some cases is just with the background, in some cases it's just like a little bit higher. So again, it really shows this really dynamic balance of different things. So it really matters what is weathering, um, what is a mineral, how quickly is it weathering, um, and what are the secondary minerals that are precipitating them, and how are they precipitating, um, and which depth is are things weathering. Uh, so it's very complex and not as easy uh, as one thinks, but this is always the case uh, in the earth system, and especially here at the sediments. Uh, there are a lot of interacting processes, and it, it looks like that a lot of the alkalinity that is produced potentially by weathering is then directly consumed in the sediment through the autogenic precipitation of these minerals. So it can be carbonate or it can be the clay minerals, and then there are the iron supplies as well, obviously, will contribute. Um, so this is one of the complications. Um, it's very dynamic, it's very difficult to, to predict. So this is something like you're currently like spending a lot of effort to kind of delineate um, the main drivers and understand what, what leads to these overshooting and these compensating responses. Um, there are also other effects. Um, there are obviously things that might limit carbonate precipitations. Um, it has been speculated that a lot of manganese might limit carbonate precipitation, but um, it, it really depends on these interplays of um, these uh, kinetic reaction uh, rate constants that are not always very well defined, especially not under natural conditions. Um, so there's a lot more research needed to really understand how the system will respond. Uh, then another uh, complication of this is like, even if you have a return flux of alkalinity back to the ocean, you would obviously directly need uh, an equilibration with the atmosphere. So the idea is that in the coastal system, this would be less of a problem because the water would be in, in more or less directly in contact with the atmosphere. But that is not, not always necessarily the case. And here you um, can really see how the system reacts depending on how much alkalinity is added and where it's added and how quickly this volume that's added is mixing with the atmosphere. So here you would be in equilibrium and that would be quite good because you wouldn't really perturb the ecosystem quite a lot. So uh, you can see here the pH response. So it's it's increasing a little bit, but not dramatically. If you don't allow for this equilibration, you would have an actually real rapid response um, of your pH and you would increase the pH a lot. And th that would be a disturbance for the ecosystems that are um, adapted to these conditions. Um, and you can see the impact on, on the calcite saturation state uh, and the calcification uh, rates. So um, you, you could have, you could really limit uh, CO2 uh, particle pressure in the, in, the, in the surface waters um, by increasing the pH and shifting the equilibrium to the other side that would lead to CO2 limitations of the ecosystem. And you can disproportionately affect calcifying organisms in all of this. So there are a lot of additional risks of how this might impact ecosystems. Um, obviously, there's a silica effect as well. It looks like this is more of a positive thing because you, you provide uh, a limiting nutrient, uh, you would increase prior productivity um, more towards diatom species. But it's still, I mean, all of these uh, phytoplankton successions are also like a delicate balance of different things. So um, as we've seen in the fertilization experiments, it's not always that easy. And then uh, a lot of these uh, minerals also contain uh, trace metals uh, that might have impact on the ecosystem as well. And all of that is um, relatively poorly studied for the time being. Uh, so even though this is a great idea because that's what the Earth system is doing to regulate the CO2, um, it's very, very difficult to uh, actually predict the response of the system. Uh, it looks like there are a lot of natural processes in the system that kind of draw the system back. So it looks like instead of contributing alkalinity to the water column, we, we consume alkalinity by burying carbonates. Um, and it looks like there's a bit of overshoot which would contribute to acidification of the environment. But a lot of this will depend on these balances and uh, there needs to be much more effort in 
understanding and also looking at the natural environments and at the ways of causing the environments to, to really identify the safe spaces where this has taken place. So to summarize this, so what is really important is like, we do need these negative emission technologies. We need to drastically reduce CO2 emissions, but we also need these negative emission technologies. They need to be developed and upscaled to reach the ambitious climate goals that were formulated in the Paris Agreement. Um, these geochemical technologies are potentially promising, but the efficiency and their risks are still very, very poorly known, very, very poorly known. So there needs to be more research on this. Um, modeling is a great way of starting this and, and really identifying the critical areas. What do we need to look at? So we are seeing like in combination with the data that's coming in from these batch experiments and natural environments, we see like we have to spend a lot of attention to the secondary minerals. Uh, we have to look at the stoichiometries of the minerals that are weathering there. What do they contribute? How much silica do they contribute? How much alkalinity? How much iron? Uh, and how does the system respond to this additional input? And explore these responses. Um, we've seen that this alkalinity production can be nearly offset by consumption through clay formation and through uh, lowering uh, carbonated solution or promoting the precipita precipitation of those. And uh, that like the local bottom water conditions have a relatively limited impact on this. So it really depends on what's happening in the sediment. And with this, I want to thank uh, the people who have worked on this. Uh, so it's uh, uh, Philippe Salzabaita, so the postdoc is working in the, in the weathering project. So he's, he's done a lot of the modeling. Um, and then in another project uh, where a lot of the model development uh, was done, the former PhD student, James Ward, and a collaborator, Kate Henry at Bass.